Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'd like to welcome you all to our new session on the tafsir of Surah Ar-Rum This will be our first session and we'll be examining and reflecting on uh, this chapter which is the 30th chapter of the Holy Quran in its current sequence and it's important to note that, of course, the, the Qur'an was not revealed in the, in the way that it's currently arranged in the, uh, the Uthman Taha a copy that we have. So the, the arrangement of the Qur'an in its current form does not represent the chronological order. The, the arrangement of the Qur'an, beginning with Surah Al-Fatiha, followed by Surah Al-Baqarah, and then ending with Surah Al-Nas, according to many scholars, actually took place after the death of the Prophet. So the arrangement of the surahs uh, was actually done by the companions and the second generation Muslims. But the, the arrangement of the verses within each surah, of course, was divinely ordained. So surah al-Rum, now the word Rum, it means the Romans. So this is known as the chapter of the Romans. It's the 30th surah in the Quran in its arrangement. It contains 60 verses. So it's a little little a uh, little more than half of the uh, of the size of surah al-anbiya which we just covered. And with respect to its historical context, you know, when it was revealed the scholars are unanimous in stating that Surah Ar-Rum is a Meccan Surah. And you can easily detect this from, from its style and from its, uh, its contents. So Surah Ar-Rum was revealed, some scholars say in the sixth or seventh year after the Ba'tha. Some have said in the fifth year after the Ba'tha. So it's essentially in the middle of the Meccan period. And it contains, as I mentioned, 60 verses. Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi, in his book, uh, Tafsir al-Amthal, he, he summarizes uh, Surah Ar-Rum and he categorizes it into seven main sections. So just to give a quick overview of the, the surah, kind of you know give, give a bird's eye view of the surah, and inshallah we'll speak a little bit about the merits of reciting and studying the surah, and inshallah we'll begin uh, with uh, by examining the first few verses. Now, 60 verses, we can divide them into seven main sections. The first part of surah Ar-Rum, deals with the the news of the defeat of the Romans and a prediction of their eventual victory in the years to come. And we'll speak about why this is relevant to the uh, to the nascent Muslim community in uh, in Mecca. The second section of Surah Ar-Rum deals with the psyche and the mentality of the disbelievers. It's essentially a criticism of their worldview, their outlook on life. So that's the second part of, of the surah. Then about halfway into the surah, you find, and, and really when you get to, uh, to verses uh, 17 to about 30, you, you really get to the meat of the surah. And that part of the surah is essentially the central theme of the chapter. And it deals with the importance of pondering over God's signs and, and the failure of many people to, to reflect on the world that surrounds them and draw, and draw meaningful conclusions from, from the world around them. When we reach verse number 30, which is the middle of the surah, and inshallah, we'll go into an in-depth discussion on all of these areas. The fourth section is, is a beautiful discussion about the concept of fitrah. 
you know, the primordial nature of man. You know, we often speak about proving the existence of God using the natural world, using external indicators. But verse 30 and a couple of the verses onward examine and establish the existence of God using an internal indicator, which is, which is the fitrah, which is the, the primordial nature of, of man. Then the fifth section of, of the surah returns to a discussion and the description about the condition of the, the disbelievers and the sinners and how their, their, world, their world view leads them to spread corruption and essentially be the source of corruption in the land and in the sea. You know, the famous verse, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ that corruption is, is now manifest, has appeared in the land and in the sea because of what the hands of men have produced. Then we come to the sixth section of the surah, which is, is a part of the surah that deals with human interaction and how we are to treat one another. So it speaks about, you know, the virtue, uh, you know, being virtuous towards your relatives, spending your money and your wealth in a just manner, and so on and so forth. So there's, there are some discussions about the importance of social interactions, how to care for people. How to care for the money that you have. So really how to how to care for these different types of trusts that Allah Azza wa Jal has placed at our disposal. And then the surah concludes with you know going back to the, the topic of Tawheed and speaking about uh, the the final destination of man and matters related to the hereafter. Now Typically, when you when you read any commentary of the Quran, you'll find that there's often a section that speaks about the merits of the surah that we are going to examine and, and study and explore. And incidentally, there are two narrations that I'd like to share just to give us a sense of how how important this chapter is and how it is held in such high regard by the, the Prophet and the, uh, the Ahlul Bayt. There's a tradition from Imam al-Sadiq where he, he speaks about the 29th and the 30th chapter, which is Surah Al-Ankabut and Surah Al-Rum. He says, مَنْ قَرَأَ سُورَةَ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ وَالْرُومِ فِي شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ who, you know, Whoever recites Surah Al-Ankabut and Surah Al-Rum in the month of Ramadan, ليلة ثلاث وعشرين on the 23rd on the eve of the 23rd which is the night of Qadr and we know that Surah Al-Rum is one of those chapters that we recite on the holiest night of the year so that alone is, is an indication of, of its significance and its importance so Imam al-Sadiq says whoever recites Surah Al-Ankabut and Surah Al-Rum in the month of Ramadan, on the eve of the 23rd of that month, فَهُوَ وَاللَّهِ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ The Imam says, I swear by God that that person will be among the inhabitants of paradise. لا أَسْتَثْنِ فِيهِ أَبَدًا And he says, without, without exception. He says, I, the Imam says, I don't qualify that statement. وَلَا أَخَافُ أَنْ يَكْتُبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ فِي يَمِينِ إِثْمَ And the, the Imam says, and I, I am not afraid, nor am I worried that God will hold me to account for making this oath, for, for making this, uh, this claim. The Imam is essentially saying that I'm, I'm fully confident that the one who holds fast to this surah, recites it and understands it, and applies it will be among the residents of paradise. And these two chapters, Surah Al Ankabut and Surah Al Rum, they occupy a great status 
in the eyes of God. So that's what Imam al-Sadiq says about the, the surah. And there's a tradition from the Prophet ﷺ where he says, مَنْ قَرَأَهَا He who recites it. كَانَ لَهُ مِنَ الْأَجْرِ عَشْرَ حَسَنَاتِ Whoever recites it receives ten hasanat, ten rewards. بِعَدَدِ كُلِّ مَلَكٍ سَبَّحَ اللَّهَ بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ You receive ten rewards for every angel between the heavens and the earth that has glorified God. Now, you know, this is, this is obviously something that's beyond our calculation. And this shows you, brothers and sisters, the barakah, the blessings and the power of the Qur'an. You know, we recite it and, and, and oftentimes we're totally oblivious of the spiritual rewards and the spiritual advantages of, uh, of these chapters. Now with that said, we'll, we'll begin uh, with the first verse and I anticipate we'll cover about uh, five, five verses inshallah today and then inshallah we'll continue our discussion next week. Surah al rum takes its name from the second verse because the, the, the word Romans is actually mentioned in the second verse of the surah. And what makes Surah Al-Rum unique is that it begins in the same way that 28 other surahs of the Qur'an begin. And that is with Al-Huruf Al-Muqatta'at, the, the disconnected letters, those mystical, mysterious letters. So there are 29 chapters in the Qur'an that begin with these disjointed letters. And there's there's a lot of discussion about what these what these letters mean, what they indicate, what they symbolize. There are a couple of, of narrations, and I'll just I'll just share with you one from from Imam Amir al Mu'minin. The Imam Alayhi mentions that Alif La Mim, whatever the disconnected letters are in the various chapters. It serves as an implicit challenge to those who doubt that the Qur'an is the word of God. Because the Qur'an from cover to cover is in the Arabic language. It's, it's written and it's spoken in classical Arabic. And the Arabic language is made up of, of certain letters. And... The everything in the Quran, if you break it down to its simplest form, it's the, the letters of the Arabic language that the Arabs would use to converse, to write, to communicate. So the, the challenge here, according to Amir al-Mu'minin, is that if you doubt that this is indeed the word of God, then use these same letters and produce something that is of the same caliber or something that is superior to it. So Alif Lam Mim or the other Alif Lam Ra and the other, other uh, disconnected letters, according to this narration, they serve as a, uh, a sort of challenge to those who doubt that the Qur'an is from a divine source. Now there are some other Chapters, you know, for example, if you look at Surah Yasin, Surah 36, uh, Surah Taha, Surah 20 of the Quran, so, in some cases, those disjointed letters are names that were given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet. And it's, it's really an expression of love. You know, when someone is very beloved to you, you often give them nicknames. And therefore you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, one of the functions at least is that it's a type of, it's an expression of endearment between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet. Some of these, some scholars have said that the, the letters, al-huruf al-muqatta'at, they, they are symbols for certain names of God that are related to the theme of the, of the surah. Others have said that these are basically 
uh, cryptic messages for the prophet that speak about future events. You know, that's why some scholars have said that Kaf, Ya, Ha, Ain, Sad is related to what, what, what is to befall uh, Imam al Hussein Hussain, the prophet's grandson in the future. So these, these disjointed letters could serve all of those functions. You know, they could be expressions of endearment to the prophet. They could be giving the prophet information about the future. They could be symbols of certain names of God. They, they could be a challenge to the to the uh, to the Meccans or any of any of those people who doubt the Quran being the word of God. But the reality is, my dear brothers and sisters, is that we don't really know the the full meaning of these uh, of these uh, these letters. It's something private between Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger, and because the Prophet did not go into great detail about the meaning of these of these verses, of these letters. It seems that it's not something that is essential for us to know in order to gain nearness to Allah. That what, what the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt have taught us is uh, sufficient for our guidance. Now one, one thing that's unusual about this surah, or at least it, at first glance, it seems to be... Uh, it seems to be outside of the norm is that typically when you see when you look at any of those 29 uh, or any of, any of the other 28 chapters that begin with these disconnected letters the verse that follows is always a verse that speaks about the greatness or the loftiness of the Quran for example if you look at surah al-baqarah alif lam mim Yas, for example, if you go, jump to Surah Yasin, Yasin wal Quran al Hakim. Taha, Surah 20, Taha, ma anzalna alayk al Quran li tashqa. So if you look at all of these chapters, the verse that follows the disconnected letters is a verse that explicitly speaks about some aspect of the of the Quran's greatness, its wisdom, its miraculous nature. But in this surah, you see Alif Lam Mim, and then what, what do we read after Alif Lam Mim? Ghulibatur Rum. The Romans have been defeated. So this is something that is uh, that kind of breaks with the norm that we see in the other verses. However, scholars have explained that this surah is still consistent with the pattern that we see with the other surahs because after alif lam mim in this surah allah speaks about the defeat of the romans and then he predicts their eventual victory and this and in this in and of itself is a testament to the miraculous nature of the quran the fact that the quran is making this bold prediction is a testament to its miraculous nature. So we go we we move on to the the next verse. Alif Lam Mim Rum. The Romans have been defeated. Now you we have to understand a little a little bit about the geography of 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 the world that the Prophet is living in. You see, Arabia is basically sandwiched between these two massive empires. You have the Persian Empire that is off to the, the, uh, the east, and then you have the Roman Empire that is off to the west. And historically, both of these civilizations were polytheistic. They were, you know, they were polytheistic nations. The Persians, of course, they were conquered by uh, by Muslims uh, during the time of the Second Khalifa. And the Romans, you know, Rome, the Roman Empire was a polytheistic nation. They were a nation of, of idol worshippers who believed in multiple gods. 
And it was only until the the time of uh, of Constantine, the emperor, the Roman Emperor Constantine, which is about three hundred plus years after after Jesus, where Christianity becomes the the official religion of the Roman state. So prior to that, uh, Rome was uh, was polytheistic. So it took you know. A number of, of centuries for the Roman Empire to adopt Christianity as the uh, the religion of of the state. Now, interestingly, when you look at the Arabs, it's you know usually civilizations and empires crave territorial expansion. You know, no, it's very rare that you're going to find an empire that says, you know, we're satisfied with our borders. We're not interested in expanding and conquering other lands. We see that it's always been the case that empires have always sought to conquer and expand their land, expand their wealth, their influence, their resources. But interestingly, neither does the Persian Empire or the Roman Empire even attempt to invade the Arab lands. And you know, this is obviously before they, they knew anything about oil, right? So so to them, to the Romans and to the Persians, Arabia and these Arabs were basically living in this desolate wasteland that had no value to them. It had no resources. It was, it was uninhabitable. It was essentially this massive sandbox that acted as a buffer between these two powerful civilizations. And and this is incidentally why the Arabic language became so refined. Because there were there was no outside influence. The Arabs enjoyed really an unprecedented type of isolation. You know, language become deteriorates when you have non native speakers interacting with, with you. But because the Arabs were so isolated their language became so refined and so nuanced that language became the pride of uh, of the Arabs. So, غُلِبَتُرُّمْ The Romans have been defeated. What does it mean that they've been defeated? Now, there was obviously a, mil a military conflict between the Romans and, and the Persians. And... Then Allah in ayah number three, He gives us more information about this this defeat. Fi adna al in a land nearby, wa hum min baghdi ghalabihim sayaglibun. So the Romans have been defeated in a land nearby, which is an uh, which is an area that is close to the the Arabian Peninsula, and it's some, some say that it's parts of of Syria, of Damascus that were that was conquered, in a land nearby, yet after being defeated, they will prevail. So when the Prophet is in Mecca, the Quran reveals this verse that the Romans have been defeated, but after this defeat, they shall become victorious. Now when will this happen? And inshallah, I'll speak a little bit more about some of the details behind this defeat and their eventual victory. So not only does the Qur'an make this prediction, because to say that, okay, the Romans were defeated, but you know they're going to come back, they're going to be victorious. That could happen next year or a hundred years from now. So the, the prediction has to be more specific. Verse number four Allah says, "Fi bid'i sinin," within a few years. You know, the word "bid'i" in the Arabic language means more than two, but less than ten. So we're talking about three to nine years. Lillahi al-amr min qabl wa min ba'd wa yawm idhin yafrah al-mu'minun. Within a few years, unto God belongs the affair before and after. And on that day, on the day when the Romans will be victorious, 
the believers shall rejoice. Now, as I mentioned, Surah Al-Rum is a Meccan Surah, revealed sometime between the 5th and 7th year after the Ba'tha. And therefore you find that the Muslim community is very, is very small. They're vulnerable. They're, they're not even really being taken seriously by the Meccans at this point. And when the, when the Mushrikeen, when the Meccans, when Quraysh received word that the Romans had been defeated by the Persians, the narrations, historians mentioned that they, you know, they were gloating and they were taunting the believers. And they were essentially saying to them that you Muslims, you, you, you are people of the book. You claim to be recipients of, of revelation. And the Christians, they're also the people of the book. We, Quraysh, we the Mushrikeen, we are without a revealed scripture. And our brothers, you know, the Persians, have defeated your brothers, the Romans. So they, they took it as a type of a good omen. And then they would say to the, the Muslims that if you ever have the audacity to, to fight us, we will defeat you in the same way that the Persians defeated the Romans. So it was having a, a very negative psychological effect on the, on the Muslim community. And therefore you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals uh, these verses. Now interestingly, when you look at the Qur'an from, really from cover to cover, the defeat of the Romans at the hands of the Persians is the only reference in the Qur'an to, to a political event that was contemporary to the Prophet beyond the, the Arabian Peninsula. And this is and this is significant, my dear brothers and sisters, because one aspect of of religiosity that is often overlooked is the importance of being aware of what's happening in the world around us. You know, oftentimes we live in our little bubbles, we live in our communities, we go to our local mosque, and we don't know any we don't know about anything that's happening outside of our our bubble. So here, when Allah tells the, Mus the Muslims who are really living in their own bubble, they're living in Mecca, and you know when you when you suffer persecution, you tend to think that you're the only one who's suffering in the world. You feel isolated. You feel almost as though nothing is happening in the world except what I am experiencing. So here, Allah wants the Muslims to take themselves out of their bubble that you need to be, at the very least, aware of what's happening pretty close to you. Yes, it's not in the Arabian Peninsula, it's not happening in Mecca, but it's happening in a place that is close by and it has an impact on you. What's happening to the Romans will affect you. And it's important for us to really internalize this message. The, the message of not living in a cocoon, not living in a bubble, being aware of, of socio-political affairs, being aware of geopolitical events, and understanding how they impact us. And, and also, being aware of the things that are happening in your own backyard, essentially. That don't, don't, don't think that religiosity is restricted to just rituals and only being up to speed with what directly affects your community. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Rum. The Romans have been defeated. And you know, just as a, a side note, the we have a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, where he, he says, Al-alimu bi zamani la tahjumu alayhi lawabis that you know part of you know we have these narrations that speak about the importance of knowing the imam 
jahili. Whoever dies without knowing the Imam of his time dies the death of someone in the pre-Islamic era. Part of knowing the Imam is knowing the time in which the Imam is living. So being aware, having knowledge of current events, of what's happening in the world, is, is an important way of, of really preparing yourself to be a follower and a supporter of the Imam. So Imam al-Sadiq says the one who knows the times is not overwhelmed by ambiguities. And this is one of the things that, that Imam al-Mahdi will struggle with. You know, there are many people around the world who are willing to give their lives for the Imam, but how many of them understand geopolitical events and know how to navigate the world that they live in. That not only are they just, but they understand the schemes and the, the manipulations of, of the enemies of Islam. They understand how the world works. So Allah says, غُلِبَتُ الرُّومِ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ فِي بِضْعِ سِنِينَ لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدِ وَيَوْمَئِذٍ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Now, in the first part of the, the 7th century, the, the Persian ruler, uh, Khusra, or Cyrus, sent an army. So this is, you know, this is a conflict that has been going on for a long time. So the, the, the early part of the 7th century, the Persian ruler sends an army to Roman territory. So, so there's always this desire for, for empires to capture other empires. Now these forces, these Persian forces, they conquered parts of, of Syria. They, they sacked uh, Damascus in, in the year 613 A.D., and then the following year, they conquered Jerusalem. And this is probably what the Qur'an means when it says, you know, fi adna al-ard, in a nearby land. Probably referring to, to, uh, to some parts of Syria that were, were conquered. So, so this happens in 613, 614 AD. And then about nine years later, Exactly as the Quran predicted. So in, in 622 AD or, or common era, the tide began to turn. When the Roman Emperor Heraclius defeated the Persians. And in 622, it, it basically was the first of a series of, of victories. So exactly about eight or nine years after this verse was revealed, saying, غُلِبَتُ Rum, eight, nine years later, the Romans defeat the, uh, the Persians. Now, when Allah says, لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدِ that unto God belongs the affair, before and after, what does this mean? Now, of course, in the context of the, the geopolitical events, you know, the, the struggle between the, the, uh, the Romans and the Persians, Allah is basically reminding us that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a reminder of Allah's ability to make one army victorious over another. You know, sometimes we look at the, we only look at the material dimension of a struggle but we forget the most important part of the equation and that is who is more in line with divine values so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plays a role a significant role that he is the one who gives victory to certain armies over the other now if we if we look at it from a more broad lens metaphysically we can understand this verse to mean that before everything was created 
And after everything uh, ceases to exist, Allah is in control. Meaning that He is the one who brings things into being. And after everything perishes, it, it basically returns to Him. Now, interestingly, at the end of the verse, at the end of verse number 4, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَحُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And on that day, what day? On the day when uh, the, the Romans gain victory after their devastating loss, the believers will rejoice. Now, there is a discussion among the ulama of tafsir regarding what, why are the believers so excited and so jubilant? Why are they rejoicing about the victory of the, the Christians, the Romans, over the Persians? So there are, there are three possible views, and really all, all three of them can be correct. Number one, the believers, the Muslims, will rejoice because of the victory of the Romans over the Persians. And this is, you know, to, to establish this sense of solidarity. That, that when, when, our, when our Christian or Jewish brothers and sisters achieve something that is in line with our goals, that is consistent with our values, we should celebrate. You know, we should see their success as our success because we are essentially part of the same Abrahamic uh, tradition. So, so this verse is a, is a beautiful verse about Muslim and Christian solidarity, that we have a common en enemy, we have common goals, our ethical system, our ethical tradition is, is very similar and and we want we, we don't want Christians to be to be vanquished. You know, we want them to have the upper hand over over the mushrikeen. So that is one one reason why uh, the believers uh, would rejoice. The second is that they're celebrating when Allah says, and the believers will rejoice on that day, it's because they're celebrating the the miraculous prediction of the Quran. That it warrants celebration because the the promise of God has been fulfilled, right? In the same way that you know we will celebrate when the Imam reappears because that is the the fulfillment of the divine promise. So the fulfillment of a divine promise is warrants uh, celebration and jubilation. And the third point that's mentioned is that when the Romans eventually defeated the Persians it actually coincided with the victory of the Muslims over the, the Mushrikeen and some say that the victory of the, of the, uh, the Romans coincided with the victory of uh, the Muslims in bed or their victory in uh, the tree of Hudaybiyah depending on on when you think the uh, the uh, when you think the actual uh, event occurred so really all of these could be the, the you know uh, correct these are all sources for for you know the Muslims to uh, reasons for the Muslims to rejoice you know celebrating the victory of the Romans over the Persians as a sign of solidarity with the Christian community and uh, celebrating the miraculous prediction of the Quran and also celebrating their own victory because it will coincide with the victory of the Romans. So in the, in the, the early battles of Islam, the, uh, the Muslims were victorious and they asserted their, their power over, over their enemies. Ayah number five. بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ يَنْصُرُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ In God's help, He helps whomsoever He will, and He is the mighty and merciful. Again, this is a reminder that 
do not think that victories happen arbitrarily. The hand of God is always behind the scenes. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who supports who he wishes. And this is important for us to not, to not think that Allah only helps Muslims. You know, sometimes we think that we have a monopoly on God, that Allah only belongs to Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that I helped, I gave victory to the Christians over the, the polytheists. So the help of God is something that is much more broad and much more universal than you and I may think. That we shouldn't think that oh, Allah never helps people unless they're Muslims, unless they're Shias, unless they're Sunnis. Allah Azza wa Jal is not closed-minded like, like you and I. Allah says that بِنَصْرِ that this is from the help of God. يَنْصُرُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah helps whoever He wishes. But this help is not arbitrary. Why? Because what does Allah say at the end of the verse? وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah is Aziz, meaning that He can empower one group over another. He can make one group victorious over the other. He has the power. He's mighty. He's Aziz. But He's also Rahim. Right? So Allah's will is not arbitrary. It is, it is full of the highest wisdom. And His plan, whatever it may be, is formed in mercy so as to safeguard the interests of all of His creatures. Allah is not just looking at what is going to benefit the Christians. He's going to look at what is, what is beneficial to all of my creatures in, in the long term. You know, uh, keeping in mind what, what the goal of creation is. Verse number 6. وَعْدَ الله لا يخلف الله وعدا ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. It is the promise of God. Now, in this context, the promise of God is the victory of the the Romans over the Persians. Never does God break His promise. Now, again, this is now in in general terms. But most people do not know. You know, brothers and sisters. Theoretically, we know that Allah doesn't break His promises. But what happens when Allah promises something, but it takes a long time for that promise to be fulfilled? You know, and this is something that even happened to the nations before us. You know, Bani Israel, for example. Bani Israel, you know, they were, they were living comfortably, especially during the time of Yusuf and in the, the years after Yusuf. But gradually, you know, when they abandoned the teachings of, of, of God, when they abandoned their religious morals, they came under the oppression of Fir'aun. And even Yusuf prophesied a Messiah who would rescue them from the tyranny of Fir'aun. And this individual was who? It was Musa. But think about how much bloodshed took place. How much, how long the Israelites had to wait. Musa السلام, even has to go into a 10 year ghaybah. You know, so he's, he's the promised Messiah. They recognize him as, as the leader of the Israelites. But he ends up killing an Egyptian and then he vanishes for 10 years. Now, the Jews know that God has promised to rescue them from this oppression. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise doesn't go according to our schedule. That's something that we have to keep in mind. That we shouldn't think that oh, Allah has reneged on His promise because it hasn't happened according to the time frame that I want it to happen in. Allah doesn't break His promise. And, and, and the most important promise that He has made is that what? What we mentioned in the previous surah. وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ One of the most important divine promises that has been made is what? 
that the earth shall be inherited by the pious. Now it's very easy to look around the world and you see all of the corruption and to become very cynical and think to yourself that, oh, I don't know if this is ever going to happen. But Allah here reminds us, Allah, this is the promise of God. You don't need to know how it's going to happen, but it will happen. لا يخلف الله وعدا. And there are many things that Allah has promised. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, for example, that if you are grateful, He will, he will increase you. وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you are grateful, I will give you more. Allah has promised that if you, if you pray properly, it will, it will keep you away from shameful acts and indecency. إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Allah says, أُدْعُونِ أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Ask me and I will respond. Call upon me and I will respond. These are all divine promises. So just because a divine promise is not fulfilled in, in, a, in a way that you think is prompt, in a speedy way, it does not mean that Allah has, has broken His promise. But people don't understand how divine promises work. They go according to Allah's schedule and not, not our own. So with that, so we'll stop at verse number six. Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion uh, next week. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, ali Muhammad. Any questions or comments? So one of the questions somebody asks uh, clarification is the defeat being mentioned the defeat of the the downfall of the Roman Empire or is it more of a local defeat? So the defeat of the Romans? Yes. So it was it was a local defeat, but it definitely weakened. Uh, the civilization because because the fact that the the quran predicts their eventual victory means that the the roman empire didn't collapse they they suffered they suffered a devastating defeat in a nearby land which is which is a uh, parts of syria which is close to the arab lands but after you know in, in a time span of about 9 years they were able to uh, to overcome the uh, the Persians. So it was uh, it was not a breakdown of their uh, of their empire. It was uh, a local defeat, but it was still a very uh, uh, it was a devastating defeat that definitely weakened them. And for this reason, the the Meccans would taunt uh, the the early Muslims, basically saying to them that this is a good omen for us because you're next, right? So those polytheists defeated those monotheists. And we're going to do the same to you if you if you dare uh, antagonize us and or poke the bear. It, it sounds like uh, this the fall and rise of the Roman Empire really was in line with the trajectory of the Muslim Ummah at the time. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, if the Quran was not ordered during the time of the Prophet then how was the word kitab interpreted by the people of the time? Because it, was an, it seemed like it was an unordered collection of chapters otherwise. So, so kitab, for example, the, the, the Qur'an of, of, uh, that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib had, in his own personal copy of the Qur'an, was in chronological order. And it had explanatory notes uh, in the margins. So... It could be a book, but it, it just wasn't in the in the order that we see it today. So again, I mean, there are some scholars that believe that it was arranged during the time of the Prophet, but that's 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 debatable. What we what we do know for certain is that the the arrangement of the verses within each surah was divinely arranged under the direction of the Prophet. But if you look at the Quran. Generally, you see that you have Surah Al-Fatiha, then you have 
the longer surahs, and then it ends with with shorter surahs. The way that it's organized in the in the current copies that we have, that it was arranged uh, by uh, it was arranged after the uh, the death of the prophet, and it doesn't really affect the. Uh, it's not that you have to read Surah Al Baqarah before you read, you know, Surah Ali Imran. The the surahs are essentially independent entities. What's more important is the organization of the verses within within each surah. And there are a few more questions. Uh, why did God help both sides, uh, the Romans and the Persians? Why did? Why did God help both sides in that conflict between the Romans and the Persians? First one side and then the other. Now, when, when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped, you know, first of all, nothing can happen without, without His permission. But when Allah allows something to happen, it doesn't necessarily mean that He endorses it or, he, or He's pleased with it. You know, sometimes defeats happen because people are ill-prepared. Right? And Allah allows things to take their natural course. You know, wh why did the Muslims, why did Allah allow the, the Mushrikeen to defeat the Muslims in the Battle of Uhud? Is it because he was on their side? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he allows things to take their natural uh, course. And uh, if believers are prepared and, you know, they, they make the necessary preparations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fortify their efforts. They will receive that type of unseen support. But, you know, one, the, uh, the victory of one, uh, of one army over another does not mean that God always favors the, uh, the victors. Yeah, w w would it be accurate to say that at least in some instances, when we're when it's when we talk about God favoring or doing taking one action or doing another action, it's referring to uh, rules that God has set up about how the world generally works. Like if you prepare, then you're successful. If you do clouds are there's moisture in the air, then rain will fall down. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not break the laws of cause and effect except under you know certain circumstances the general rule of thumb is that Allah he has set certain laws that govern the world the law of cause and effect and and though that law reigns supreme now there are certain instances where you know if you look at the battle of Badr the battle of Badr I mean if you if you look at that just from a logistical purely material perspective it, there's there's really no explanation as to how the, uh, the that small army defeated that large army. So when 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 believers are fully prepared, when they do their due diligence and they're well prepared, and they fight with proper intentions, with godly intentions, in addition to the natural causes and effects, the natural outcomes, there is that added support. So that's when that's when you receive that extra that that extra divine support. When you've exhausted everything at your disposal, you have the best of intentions. That's when you get that that divine uh, that divine help. So the the help of God is uh, is conditional, right? The help of God is not going to come to people who are ill prepared, right? And say, oh, you know, because we're mu'minin, we don't have any weapons. But Bismillah, that's not how it works. You have to. You have to be prepared, and you have to you have to have the right intentions. That your intentions have to be in in line with the values of and the the, the goals that Islam has set. And when that happens, that's when you you you're able to solicit that that divine support. Uh, another question: Is there is there not a discordance in supporting Roman Christians in the surah when the Roman elephants used by Abraha to destroy the Kaaba at uh, at Amul Field? So is this a change in Islamic policies? So, so can you can you repeat? I'm not sure I understood the question. Can you repeat the question? 
so the question is basically about uh, is it's kind of pointing out that there seems to be a contradiction that uh, right now the surah seems to be supporting the roman armies but earlier uh in a previous generation when the, the roman elephants were being used to destroy the kaaba at that time the roman like, were being condemned so this seems to be a change in attitude towards the romans so it, it you know it, it depends on you know the intentions of those two armies were were very different so you know one one army wanted to destroy the house of god the other army were, was was fighting off you know uh an invader and in addition to that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives victory to one group over the other he's not just looking at the immediate outcomes or the immediate consequences but sometimes things happen and the the fruits the, you know this action it will bear fruits hundreds and thousands of years later so what 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 happened with that victory doesn't necessarily mean that the benefit is going to be experienced you know uh, in the near future it could be something that happens you know in the distant future i'll give you a very simple example when ibrahim alayhi salam brought hajar and Ismail to Mecca. What was he doing? You know, if you just look at that simple action, it seems to be very cruel. A father leaving behind his, you know, his, uh, his spouse and uh, his, his newborn child in a desolate land, in the middle of the desert, and he leaves. But you find that Ibrahim السلام, was doing something that would bear fruits thousands of years later. That he, he was essentially planting Ismail in this land so that generations later a great, great, great grandson by the name of Muhammad will appear. So a lot of things that happen are based on divine calculations that we will that we will understand or we might we may never understand that that will bear fruits much later so we can't say we can't be short-sighted and say that why did allah favor this group here but not here there are so many variables and so many factors that it's really it's really beyond us but what we know for sure is that everything happens for a purpose and everything happens to allow people to reach the the intended goal of creation, which is to attain nearness to God. And sometimes bad things have to happen for people to realize their uh, their hidden potentials and to and to draw closer to uh, to God. So it fits into the uh, the the overall divine plan. Uh, thank you. And could you please explain what is the relevance of the Roman Empire towards Islam? What is the relevance of the uh, of the Roman Empire towards Islam? Well, I mean, we know that, for example, the uh, the the Prophet sallallahu sent letters, especially later on in his life, he sent letters inviting uh, uh, the Roman Emperor to to Islam. Uh, there were many people who uh, who ended up converting to Islam from uh, from the Roman Empire. It was important uh, for the Muslims to establish a relationship with uh, with the Christian community. So the relevance is that you know number one, being aware of of geopolitical events at that time, and that's a lesson that transcends that uh, that historical period. The importance of uh, of Muslim and Christian relations, right? And uh, and so, so these are some of the things that we can uh, that we can draw from uh, from these uh, these ver from from uh, from these verses. And uh, another question: uh, Taking the idea of what has been discussed in this lecture, how does that inform what is currently occurring in the land of Palestine and Israel in the context of the fulfilling the promise of God. So how does it fit in with this context? And he gives the example of uh, 
For example, the Israelis were promised land and power. Now, I don't know what's written in, in, in their scriptures regarding the, uh, the land of, uh, of Jerusalem. <clears throat> but we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He does not promise a piece of land to any, any specific group. The, the, what, what's mentioned in the Quran is, and what we've mentioned, what we've uh, uh, reflected on in Surah Al-Anbiya, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدَ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِ الصَّالِحُونَ That the, the earth, with all of its political structures, will be inherited by, and incidentally Allah doesn't say by, by He doesn't mention a religious label. He doesn't say Jews or Muslims or Christians because some Muslims are oppressors. Some Jews are oppressors. Some Christians are oppressive. Allah mentions, they are my righteous servants. Ibadi as salihun So when we look at what's happening in, in Palestine and Jerusalem, in those, in those hot spots, we have to always keep in mind that we shouldn't, we shouldn't get too bogged down by, by labels. You know, sometimes we have this tendency to, to basically excommunicate Jews, excommunicate, that if, if you don't have the label, the right label, I have nothing to do with you. What's more important is that we, we understand each other's values. We, we understand each other's ideology. There are many, many Jews who oppose what's happening in, uh, in Jerusalem. You know, not every Jew is a Zionist. So we have to understand that we can't simplify and put people into these neat categories. We have to be more nuanced. You know, what we want more than anything, and the, the mission statement of our imam is the establishment of justice. And we know that the, the imam, alayhi salam, will have, Jew, he will have Ahlul Kitab living under his government. And the narrations say that he will he will he will judge the people the Jews by their scriptures and the Christians by their scriptures. So there will be a sort of pluralistic society under the twelfth Imam, and because of his vast knowledge of their scriptures and his just rule, many of them will will end up joining the uh, the Imam. So I mean, those are just some of my thoughts regarding uh, the uh, the issue of Jerusalem in light of. Uh, of the verses that we're covering. And inshallah, I'll, I'll maybe shed some more light as we continue with the surah.